Let's talk a little spring breakout now. It was a blast being able to bounce around Florida and catch some of these games. We've talked Skeens Holiday. Uh, that was something that we had to just get right into the, the day we saw it. We, we sat in a dark Airbnb. Yes. I don't think the lights were on. I don't think we turned the no. lights on. It was just like, all right, time, to, we time got, to get every thought about that game out. And it was a spectacle for a game that really wasn't that eventful in terms of the action on the field. But I think it was everything – you could have asked for from an attention standpoint, uh, the way it was covered. Yep. And and I thought that was a great tone setter for spring breakout and everything. And I thought really got things going. Um, you know, it was unfortunate that you had a little bit of rain out west, very rare in Arizona that banged a couple games. Yeah, I think it was two games that were banged. So four teams didn't get it. So that part is unfortunate. Uh, I think MLB at points, you know, had some games that could have been maybe better televised or or more visible so we yeah and like i'll I'll cite the exact example because it is the biggest brand in baseball right now the dodgers are in korea we get it but the only dodgers social media interaction with spring breakout was the dodgers retweeted mlb's final score graphic of the spring breakout game yeah the dodgers are the global brand in baseball now Mm -hmm. they have to push the future better than that Especially when Tyron Lorenzo runs into <laughs> you know, one. I've got him on this list. Right? So, no, I agree. I mean, that's something that, you know, I would. we saw a lot of the other teams promote their minor leaguers and promote what's going on and, and really, I think, amplify the efforts of spring yeah. breakout. And I'd say 25-26 did an excellent mm-hmm. job with it. And that was surprising, especially from the Dodgers. I get it. They got a lot of a lot of things going on yeah. and a, a lot of bigger things going on at yeah. the big league level. But at the same time, like that's why we're doing this thing, right? That's why we have it going on. But you know, I, I thought it was really fun, especially we got to St. Lucie. A lot of Mets fans there that were very yeah. passionate about you know, their players and their prospects and excited to see them. I think when we saw the Nationals guys, that was a lot of fun too. But um, the Twins was interesting because. I don't know if there's as much of an engaged community of Twins yeah. fans there. So it was a great crowd for the spring training game. I actually filed out a little bit for yeah. the spring breakout game, but it seemed like that was a game that a lot of people were tapped into on social sure. and were tapped into maybe on television. Uh, and that's the other side of it too is is I think – I don't – we'll see what the numbers are and what the wrap-up is if MLB puts something out. But I'd like to imagine that there was a lot of success on social media play, mm-hmm. uh, on – I think visibility in terms of people watching, it's all yeah. relative, but I'm, I'm interested to see how it compares to a, a you know, general spring training game yeah. at this point uh, of, of spring training. But it just seemed like there was a lot more interest. It seemed like it was something that was refreshing for fans. Yeah. And, you know, we're at the point right now at spring training where kind of over it. I, you know, I think a lot of people are, are, have had enough because – I know the players have had enough. Like yeah. they're ready, they're ready for the season to start at this yeah. point. And you know, it's really exciting at the beginning of spring training, and it gets a little bit monotonous, and we're just ready for the real thing. And I thought that spring breakout, and, and I hope it can continue to be that perfect breakup a little bit yeah. to to push you through the final stretch here of like 10, 12 days to get you to opening day. A hundred percent. I hope that this is the first year of a tradition. Yeah. I I really want this to be something that happens every single year because us as people that cover it, us as people that will go and sit there and maybe get your first chance at evaluation um, or just like take in the vibe, like, Hey, see the young stars. And we saw Travis Sikora make his pro debut. We saw Charlie Soto Mm -hmm. make his pro debut in front of his entire family. Like that ballpark in Fort Myers turned into the Charlie Soto fan club, which is great. Um, But like, you've got the opportunity to see guys um, like Leo DeVries, right? I, I don't think the Padres ended up playing. I think yeah. they might have been one of the games that was rained out. But, like, Leo DeVries is somebody that everybody's talking about that no one has seen play yeah. yet. Which is, which so, is. like, you've got the opportunity to see those guys play. Felny and Celestin plays. Lazaro Montes plays for Seattle. This is an opportunity to showcase the guys that your organization just paid big money to that nobody really gets to watch until they get onto an affiliate. And beyond that, or to kind of extend that from a pitching perspective, I mean, pitching prospects are so scattered across every level. Yeah. So to be able to see just continued, uh, you know, and, and it was unfortunate some guys got scratched here and there, but the, the Pirates is a perfect example. Like we see Skeens, but then we get Bubba Chandler as well. And yeah. it's like, okay, wow. Well, and it, then you get healthy Hunter Barco. And, yeah, yeah. And that was amazing to see. And, and there's no way that you're going to be able to see all those guys right. in a row like that. So it's almost like the Arizona Fall League, but an extension of that. And it's great to be able to see all those players in, in one spot. So, from an assessment standpoint, that was awesome. Um, it was also great that you were able to get several at bats for a lot of the top prospects. Mm-hmm. That part made it really fun, and it just seems like a very unparalleled event. And again, the fall week I think is super underrated, but this is just a more 
entertaining. It's concentrated. It's more concentrated. There's a little bit more fandom involved because it's one team of, yeah. of your prospects, you know, your favorite team's prospects. And I think it's something that's going to continue to grow. And I hope fans continue to latch on to it because I think it was a great idea by Major League Baseball. Pretty good execution. And I think they can execute it even better next year. I've got a lot of guys that we're going to run through here. But the one that stole the show in our in-person looks was Xavier Isaac for the Tampa Bay Rays. Multi-homer day. Had a double the other way. Yes. Uh, opposite field homer and dead center homer. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I'll really open the floor to you, but I will tell you, I've never seen a, a a guy that young and that filled out already. Yep. He passed the eye test with flying colors and that swing, you close your eyes and you see best first baseman in baseball type bat. Yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty special to see. And you talk about filled out, he, he's converted a lot of the, you know, the, his weight into yep. into good weight now. And he probably feels like he can move so much better. He had a foot issue his senior year, mm-hmm. and I think that that caused him to, to put on a, a, a few extra pounds. And um, you know it, it, that affects your mobility, yeah. especially as a young player and a big guy. So now he's slimmer. He looks athletic, and you know, I think people in the beginning you see a lot of kind of dated scouting reports really saying, "Oh, he can't move that well." He's an athlete, man. For a guy that that's six four, that big. But now we're seeing the athleticism more because he's lighter on his feet. He, he probably feels great. And you can see it. And there's more quickness there as well in terms of the bat. Um, I got a lot of questions when we put out the end of the season update uh, you know, for the top 100. It like 40. 40. Yeah. You know, why first baseman at 40 at the lower levels? And it, it was really because of how advanced the swing is, yeah. how much power potential there is. And, and honestly, it's rare to see a swing that advanced and that powerful that young. So then you see that the results and the numbers back that up. And uh, the rest was history. But seeing that in person – Seeing what he's able to do with, with with several different pitches in different locations, and just the controlled aggression, uh, the the power, but also the the smooth aspect of his swing, the body control. I mean, those were three. Of the, I don't know if I've seen a player take like three swings that impressive in one game in the minor leagues in a long time. I mean, the, the double was a line shot the other way. That there was so much whip that you heard the bat hit his backside. Then that home run to dead center. I mean, that, that was just an unbelievable swing to, to beat the, the center field wall off the batter's eye. And then a backside homer, the way he did a no doubter backside, like th- that was just a display of brilliance. And he's only getting better. Yeah. He's only, he's super young. His numbers got better and better. This guy's going to be a monster. And, and it's not just because of that one game. It just was uh, almost a concentrated example of everything we love about him. The Rays got another, <laughs> like they have another, folks. They aced it. They took a high school first baseman in the first round, and they nailed it because, yep. of course, they did. They're the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, another guy, first round pick that I, I think confused some at the time because there were very limited looks in college. Granted, it is a very prestigious program. Is Spencer Jones of the New York Yankees? Spencer Jones has stolen headlines in spring training. He goes to spring breakout, and he hits two homers that were majestic. One at one oh six five. And then I think he went 1085 dead center. And I think it was like 415, 420 feet. He's dialed in. Yeah. He's found it yes. too. It, this was a guy that improved the contact rates as the year progressed, but couldn't tie that in with loft. Mm-hmm. And so it happens, right? When we were talking about it, when you're trying to make more contact, you're a big dude. How do you make more contact, but also still have that swing that's geared for backspin and elevation? Because at the end of the day, he needs to elevate. Yeah. He finally, coming into this year, Change his setup a little bit, change his bat angle. And I think having the bat angle a little bit more vertical instead of flatter, he, he seems like he's just able to get on plane a lot easier yeah. and get on plane earlier. And now by doing that, it seems like he, he's living in the zone longer. He's able to elevate more and he's starting to feel more confident that he can get to pitches. Cause I felt like before he started to cheat a little bit more, that was resulting in him catching balls out front, being a little bit aggressive and, and rolling over a bit more. We're seeing him small sample, but much more selective yeah. now. So I'm seeing more confidence in him seeing the ball earlier and we're seeing him elevate and just drive the ball in the air. And I think it's because he's able to get on plane. Very subtle mechanical difference, but for guys like that, it can make all the difference in the world. Do you think he's got a little bit of like the James Wood situation that's going on right now where that's a big guy that, you know, might've been too long for his own good at the very beginning, like very mm-hmm. beginning. Last year, you saw at points, he was too big, too long for his mm-hmm. own good. Now he looks like, the huge human that shouldn't be as controlled as they are. That's the conversation we had about Wood like a week and a half, two weeks yes. ago, 
we can, I feel like we can have the same conversation about Spencer Jones. A hundred percent because, you know, I think people say, oh, a small sample, like let's see him do it. And I agree, but you also need to take the context here, which is Spencer Jones has had way less at bats than pretty much any first round college bat that yeah. we've maybe seen. Wait, it's him and Reggie memory. Crawford, right? Yeah. It's him and Crawford that were like, and Crawford's a pitcher only now. Yeah. So, you know, I think when you look at it from that perspective, like he barely hit, he hit really one year in college and he put up unbelievable numbers there. So this was really his like second full season of, of hitting yeah. and, and really being thrown to the, the wolves there and, and getting some challenging assignments and getting the double A and still holding his own. He put up an above average offensive season. It wasn't like he wasn't good. He just wasn't the, the guy that, you know, when the draft happened, I'm like, this guy could be right. an absolute monster. He might be James Wood 2.0. Yeah. It, like, and it was a little early on that, but right. we've seen him make the changes and get there. But I, the reason why I'm talking about the small sample and why it matters a little bit more with Jones is tangible adjustment. He's barely played relative to a lot of other guys. Mm-hmm. And now it's all clicking. Kind of makes sense that this could be a point in which you know you hit this. I don't know how many at bats he's had since the beginning of his of his college career, but you hit a certain number of plate appearances, and all of a sudden you start to control your body a bit yeah. more. I mean, this guy was pitching a ton in high school. Some liked him even more as a pitching prospect. Yeah. So I, I think this is finally a time for him to really figure himself out as a hitter, yeah. and he looks like a guy that's done that. It's so funny, like. I, it it's a Yankee thing. It's a Yankee thing. I it might not be a Dodger thing. I don't know, but like it happened with Jason Dominguez too, where you just expect a one forty WRC plus, and they give you a one ten, and it's like, well, that guy sucks now. Yep. No, <laughs> he's he's fine. And and I'll tell you what, I'm glad you bring up Dominguez. What did Dominguez do? You know, he was tooled up, uh-huh. super exciting. Swing needed work on both sides. He got he fixed it he became you know, smoother yeah yes. he, he made serious adjustments to be able to elevate more yeah. to be able to make more contact and in turn his swing decisions improved but the yankees you, you you can talk about you know not really having a ton of like homegrown examples because they like the trade guys or whatever but the yankees do have a lot of recent examples of guys that they've helped make some tweaks and yeah. maximize and i think spencer jones is the latest one and i think that's part of the reason why they're drafting these physical or signing these physical freaks. Uh, I know Volpe's a little bit of an exception, but I think they were just happy to get him where they got him. I think they feel like they can help these guys make some tweaks and get them where they need to go. I even like the adjustments that Austin Wells made mm-hmm. when he got to the big league level, started to swing it much better. Uh, we'll see how they do with Pereira. You, you know, you're not going to bat a thousand, but I do think that this is another example of the Yankees' development being pretty solid. Yeah. It was kind of a dud of a spring breakout. There were only three multi-homer games. Um, so we got to talk about the third multi-homer <laughs> game. Jace Young of the Detroit Tigers made a change that you noticed. What was that change? Well, Jace Young is just crushing balls in the air. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know if there was a substantive change with him as much as it was just a guy that I think is, is starting to come into his own a okay. little bit. Um, with him, he's always had that unique bat angle. He's always had that that gets him on plane really easily. Yeah. And that's another like guys need to make adjustments to help them get on plane. And with Jace, he's done that. I don't know if there's as much of a substantive change with him as it's just continuing to get more comfortable with his pitch selection, his approach, because he was aggressive. And now he seems like he's leveraging his hitters counts a little bit better. He's hunting at the right spots and and shutting down spin a little bit better. And all of a sudden we're seeing him pulverize baseballs. Um I, I'm I'm starting to really buy in more on, on the Jace Young thing. You know, like I was a little hesitant because yeah. it's like, is the hit tool going to be there enough? You know, like his brother, now it looks like, you know, he may not be as good bat to ball as his brother, but he can elevate more. There might be more raw impact in there. And he's and he's a really good second baseman. He should be fine there, right? He should be really solid Hey, he there. won a minor league gold glove. I don't know what that means, but like he won a minor league gold glove. I'd love to see the DRS numbers, but gold glove. <laughs> hey, he can't, he can't be the worst then, right? right so no, suck. but I, I will say like, it seems like he's starting to really come into his own and, and figure out who he wants to be as a hitter, yeah. which, I mean, if he's a power hitting second baseman and elevating, you know, a little bit more now, uh, I think he, he could be pretty scary. So he's not sexy. Like he, he is a prospect lacks sex appeal, just like yeah. big bro. Big bro had no sex appeal because he was older Right, he was he was twenty five years old when yep. he when he graduated from prospect status, and frankly, like th- there's not you know the crazy EVs that you'll see. There's there's no data point that I feel like you really look at with Chase Young, and it's like, oh, this guy has superstar potential, and he doesn't have no. superstar potential, but he's got fringe all star every year yep. potential, which 
is exciting, and we talk about making boring sexy with Brendan Donovan. Like, yeah, he's he, he can be better than he's, Brendan yeah, Donovan. He, he won't be too way more impact. Yeah, yeah, he won't be too too boring because you could see twenty five thirty home yeah. runs. And and the other thing that's interesting, and and I guess the one change that I'm hoping to to see, and I think we're starting to see, is he's very pole oriented, yeah. and that's yeah, that's fine because he, he he's so yeah. lofty, and he's able to. I mean, he had a thirty five percent ground ball rate last year, but it seems like now he's still going to try to hunt and and pull stuff pull side. And really yank some stuff that he can lift, but I think we're seeing him want to be a little bit more of a complete hitter. Scorch one the other way in spring training the other day. I think trying to keep the bat in the zone, it kind of got in and out too quick. And now if he's able to do that, I and mean, the pull side's always going to be there, if he's a little bit more complete of a hitter. Uh, he's going to be one of the better. He could be one of the better offensive second basemen you know, that we have kind of coming up in this next wave. Jumping over to Toronto, Addison Barger uh, mm-hmm. had a couple of balls that sounded like gunshots off the bat. It was amazing to hear what that guy can do. And we've had some back and forth on him because I might've just caught him in like a down week, but I was like, ah, I just don't, I don't know. Like I am worried personally that I, and I said it to you this way, any at bat after the sixth, I'm worried might be uncompetitive because he gets 98 upstairs. What's he going to do with that, with that big leg kick? And you know, it's, it's a crazy hard swing. You're like, dude, he swings hard as shit. Like, he, he might just be great and figure it out. Um, I'm never going to doubt you again because he had a couple of balls there where I was like, wow, that's loud and that's impressive. It's just so quick. Yeah. And, and yeah, there's a lot of moving parts, but he starts it early. He gets to where he wants to be. And once he launches, that bat – I mean, it's as quick of a bat as you're going to see. But it's, it's one of those things where I don't like the moves. I, I I'm obviously – I would not want that much movement in any hitter I'm looking at, but mm-hmm. it gets to a point where it's, it's hard to say that it's not going to work. You know, when, especially when you're seeing the contact rate steadily improve, the EVs are really good. And, and the other side of it was, and I think it was Dan Shulman on the, on the Blue Jays broadcast uh, talking about it, but you know, we had that elbow, he had that elbow issue last yeah. year, Barger did. And it he said it didn't affect his, his throwing arm as much as it, it really affected his swing and his, and his ability to, to, to really just consistently get his best swing off. Interesting because his ground ball rate elevated. Uh, he's still hitting the ball really, really hard. So now we're seeing him in spring training have a little bit more feel, be able to elevate. And, and I think that lead arm just seems to be more comfortable. And I mean, if your arm's not feeling right and you have a max effort swing like that, yeah, it, it's probably going to affect you a little bit. I, I really like what I'm seeing from him. And, and I think that swing right there is just another example. It's left on left. He puts up good numbers against lefties too. Yeah. That's the other re- reason why I think he could be an everyday guy. He's not a guy that you need to platoon. And I think another thing is if you're able to produce left on left, I think that says a lot about your moves not really taking you out. Right? Yeah. Like loud guys that have a lot of moving parts that can't stay on the baseball, they're going to get chewed up left on left. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't, and he hasn't. Yeah. Double trouble in Colorado. Uh, Drew Romo, Zach Veen. I want to quickly go through both of those guys because they frankly look different than they did last year. Uh, Veen, obviously, it, it was hand surgery. Did he have surgery on his hand? Or was it... It was like wrist, hand, I think it was like wrist or hand, something like that. I want to start with Romo, though, the catcher. Drew Romo was a smaller guy mm-hmm. that, you know, everybody, you know, kind of doubts the amount of impact that he can have. Or I guess, like, I don't know, maybe maybe shooting a little bit lower than mm-hmm. the typical projected impact for a catcher. Uh, heard on the Rockies telecast that he's 220 pounds now, and we, like, did some freeze frames. It looks like a like a very good 220 pounds. He put on great weight. Forearms have veins that you don't see in normal people. I mean, like a good jawline. I, jawline. I can, oh, we're talking I, jawline. We can do jawline if we want. Like, I'm all about talking dudes' physiques. But, like, the reality is Drew Romo looks the part now. And that can help a ton, especially behind the plate. Um, I agree. And, and he already was good back there. Yeah. And I think it's going to help a ton with the, just the impact. Yes. And, yeah. uh, of course. But, you know, we were talking about how we don't love max. You know, we're not going to talk too much right. about max exit velocity. But in these kind of instances where we don't have a large enough sample to look at 90th or yeah. average, it is always eye-opening when you have a guy that you have the narrative is there, mm-hmm. adds strength. His max was, I think, around 106 and change last year. He's already posted multiple 106s this year and a 107 okay. in the spring training stretch. Yeah. So. Obviously, it's it's turning into a little bit more impact. And if he's even got fringe average power, the field of hits great. You know that he's going to be a good defender. We got to see if that he keeps having that every other year thing as a switch hitter. Yeah. That's got to even out. But I mean, if he's hitting the ball harder, 
it, it's just going to bode well. well. Even if it doesn't turn into home runs, the bad is going to rise. It's going to split the gap more. And he's just going to be a more consistent offensive piece. He's the future of their, of their catching yeah. position. He's always earned high marks for his makeup. And I think just seeing him return this year with a better body yeah. and, and look like he's scorching the ball a little bit harder, I think is a testament to that. He's going to be he's going to be their guy. Veen has the opportunity to force himself back into the Rockies' future mm-hmm. plans, right? Because that that's a guy that fell off every top 100 this past year yeah. because last year was so bad. Um, he looked the part, man. He looked filled out. Those strides, they're oh crazy gosh. long. And we saw a ball outer half that he stayed on and drilled the left center. I, I love him. I've got so much bias when it comes to Zach Veen because I think that guy had like best prospect in baseball type potential yeah. and that fell off. But – I would love to see him recapture some of that prospect. Because I think that guy can be a really good big leaguer still. He absolutely can. Yeah. And I think I think the injuries probably affected him more than you know people want to mention. Yeah. Well, we hear about it ad nauseum with Marcelo Meyer, and it definitely affected him too. But yeah. I don't know if Veen's gotten the same level of uh, – I think a lot like what would it be vindication? Like what, what, what I guess like he just he hasn't been given a break as no. much as mine. And and some of the people I've talked to that you know cover the Rocky system a little bit closer or or are just involved there have said you know, they really feel strongly that it was a huge hindrance on him last year, especially for a guy that's big and still kind of learning to feel out his swing and needs to be quick and efficient to the ball. Uh, but I also think you see some of the small samples of spring training this year. He's not getting blown up, and I, I'm not going to look at small samples in terms of oh he's hitting 350 or whatever but guys that zach veen last year you give him 10 at bats he's getting blown up yes. in, in big league spring yes. training i don't care who's throwing uh he's not getting blown up he looks comfortable and then in, the, in that game he looked like the zach veen that we saw in 2022 the strides to first base are crazy i don't think he got there in like five steps wild so that's the other side of it is even if the power doesn't totally come the bats a ball looks like it's getting better as he's just mm-hmm. feeling better and he can steal 40 bats. And, and he's a big enough body to have enough impact if the bat to ball is good. Yep. Like, so I, I'm excited. I, I think that that one swing on the outer half, like he's going to have that plate coverage really easily. Yeah. I, I'm curious if he can turn stuff that's hard inside around. Yeah. And that, that'll be a challenge for him. But being able to hit stuff away, I, I think that's a good sign that his body's in a good place and that the path looks pretty good. I have officially hitched my wagon to Tyrone Lorenzo <laughs> of the L.A. Dodgers. Lorenzo hit a homer. Your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> that swing was good. It was really good, and it was loud, and it was fun, and I wish the Dodgers retweeted it, but they <laughs> didn't. Um, he is a masher. I think he had, what, 25 homers in low A last year in Rancho? Maybe a little bit fewer. Uh, I'll tell was, you in three seconds. He, here, 24. 24. So he had 24 homers in low A last year. Um, this guy is, if I had to handpick one breakout this year, mm-hmm. guy that is going to be a consensus top 100 prospect, it can be, I think, a rushing type progression yep. where you don't really know too much about him and then you learn a lot and you love him. Yeah. And I, I think that's Lorenzo this year. I haven't seen a ton of the defense, but I think just seeing what he can do already with the bat. It's crazy. It's, it's, it's I, exactly what you said. That, that bat is so good in terms of just – how hard he hits the baseball, how, how good the swing looks and advanced it looks, and how quick and powerful he is. And he's a switch hitter, too. Uh, that he's going to, even if the catching isn't totally there, like he's going to force his way, I think, onto top 100 list just because of the way that he can swing it. He's also super patient. So he hedges some of the swing and miss with that. Uh, but that swing, just seeing him get that off in, in that game, it was, again, I don't like looking at one-offs, but you look at that swing and you're like, okay, that guy's got something there. He could grow into something really special. And I think the Dodgers have something here with Lorenzo. The best hitter on Saturday at Roger Dean <laughs> Chevrolet Stadium between the Marlins and the Cardinals was Griffin Conai. And I know that you don't love talking about him from a prospect lens all the time because you feel like you do enough of it. Um, I know how tight you are. I'm sure anybody that listens to the show knows how tight you are, but he made legit swing changes that yeah. Christina DeNicola wrote about on MLB.com. Um, he looks really, really yeah. good, man. So, like, you can give me 10 seconds. You can give <laughs> me 90. Just, like, Griffin Conine looks really good right now. Yeah, and, and it was a cool piece. I thought, you know, Christina did a great job, you know, highlighting Jeff, you know, Jeff mm-hmm. Conine. And, um, you know, just the way that their relationship, their dynamic there, because he's very hands-off, but now, like, he is involved with the Marlins, wants to help, and doesn't want to be too, too involved. And I, I think they have a really good relationship now that is really built to the point where 
they help each other in, in a lot of ways. And I think Jeff has really been able to help him in a way that it's like not overbearing dad, but like, yeah. Hey, I played for 18 years. Uh, I, I, I know what you're I know going what I'm through doing. Yeah. and, and here's some mental aspects to like how you should approach things. But uh, in terms of the swing, I mean, he just got back to what worked in high school. Yes. You know, when I saw him legitimately dominate everybody down here, he just, I think when you try to get to a place that, you know, you want to be feel wise, swing wise, you can get so far away from what's natural mm -hmm. that you almost forget where you used to be in terms of your setup and things like that. And at the end of the day, your setup should be natural. And then it should be however it's easiest for you to get to the launch position you need to get to. Yeah. And I think he figured that out this off season of, Hey, I'm, he watched a bunch of his high school video, his college video is where he was Cape player of the year yeah. and things like that. And it's like, that's where I always ate. That's how I always was good. Yeah. And then applied some of the things that he's learned through the years. And all of a sudden now, He's he tore up big league spring training. Marlon's scouting director, Hector, Hector Crespo, said yep. he stood out. Yep. Um, I think Marlon's bench coach said he stood out. And, you know, I'm really happy for him because, I mean, I think this Marlon's team might not be that good this year. <laughs> and I'm hoping he gets an opportunity because I know he's older, he's 26, and that people aren't, you know, tapped into 26-year-old prospects. But uh, he works his butt off, and uh, I think he could be a, a, a nice piece for the Marlins. And I think he really deserves an opportunity this year. And, and I'm, I'm glad to see him elevating himself, you know, in the organization because there was points last year where he was lost. And, you know, I was wondering, you know, if that might be it. And he'd yeah. be the first one to tell you that too. And thankfully things clicked and it looks like it could be a total change. Similarly to David Schneider. Right. He had a point in which, you know, with the Blue Jays, he was struggling in high A. Yeah. And he talked about it on the show. He thought that might be it. And, and he was almost thinking, you know, maybe, maybe this is it. This is the end of the road. Something clicks mentally and a slight mechanical change. And all of a sudden, you know, he, he's a key piece for the Blue Jays moving yeah. forward. Um, that's what makes baseball so cool. And that's why you always got to be tuned into adjustments and never completely swear off a player. A hundred percent. I will also say if I have more than a year of minor league footage or college footage to work with, I will never watch high school footage. I think Griffin is the first person that I voluntarily watched high school <laughs> video of when, who fits like that criteria. So Fair thank enough. you for showing me the high school video. Um, two pitchers that we want to talk about before we say see ya. Jacob Mizorowski of the Brewers, Tink Hentz of the Cardinals. Let's start with Mizorowski. It was two and two-thirds, no hits, no runs, five Ks, three walks, two hit batters. <laughs> so it was uh, it was two and two-thirds, no hit, five punch outs, but five base runners. It's Jack Flaherty's no hit bit. <laughs> the whip sucks, <laughs> but at the end of the day, nobody got a hit. Um, he kills me. You get used to it. He kills me. Uh, here's the thing that stood out to me. We know that he's going to strike guys out. He's not going to give up many hits and he's going to walk and hit guys. The fastball though, we already talked about how it's outlier pitch. Yeah. It's 80. You have 80. It's even more outlier now because he killed horizontal. So he has 85. He's <laughs> like, got an 85. It fastball. was 70 present, 80 future. Now I think it's 80 okay. because, so I was looking at the shape and the difference and all of a sudden now, instead of it being, you know, and guys usually that are super low release like that, they're going to be you know, close to dead zone shape, but it doesn't matter because you're low release like Ryan right. Wu and you know, Brent Price Miller. Right. We talk about those guys. He's now getting like 14, 15 inches of vertical and two, three, four inches of horizontal. So now it's even more ride. He adjusted his, his VAA and it's even flatter. I, I think this is the best fastball, not only in the minor leagues, like, he could get to the big leagues, and as long as he's around the zone, it could instantly be a top three fastball in Major League Baseball. Top three. I was going to say, is it like, is it better than Strider's? If it's an 80, it's, it's got to be a top three. Yeah. And I think it instantly can be a top three with this adjusted shape. And I think we saw that. I mean, nobody even really had a chance against that fastball. It's all about the command of the secondaries and things like that. And we know how good the secondaries can be. But he could be, with that fastball, could be 65, 70% fastball and probably still get through a lineup two times and, and be a really effective starter. But I think the secondaries look pretty good too. It's coming along. He, he, he looks like a monster. Just the command just needs to be below average. It doesn't even need to be like good. It just needs to be below average right now. It's well below average and, and, and it's hard to succeed that way. Okay. Let's uh, let's tie a ball on this thing with Tink Hens of the St. Louis Cardinals. And Tink was somebody that I queue up Katy Perry, right? Like you, you're super hot on the prospect industry is super hot on, and then he gets to double, and frankly, he's not that good. Yeah. Um, so you get cold, and then all of a sudden he, he comes out in spring breakout, 
And he threw well in spring training, too. So uh-huh. he throws well in spring training. He throws really well in spring breakout. This is a guy that, like, I don't know. I last year was the year that I was going in and I was like, okay, he is circled. I, I am circling him as one of five guys, hitter or pitcher, that I really need to watch a lot of this yep. minor league season. I think I might do it again. Yeah. Like back to back years where I'm like, yeah, Tink Hens is somebody I need to learn a lot more about. Yeah, and, and I think he looks healthy. I mean, he had he's had some weird injuries, like a chest thing, and then it was a finger thing that he was trying to throw through. And I think he's a guy that really rips it off of his fingers because it's over the top and and backspun. And I think it was affecting it. And we saw the fastball life just not there. We saw the command of his secondaries not there. And all of a sudden, he looks more like the Tim Kents that became quickly one of the best pitching prospects in, in baseball, or at least one of the more exciting pitching prospects in baseball. You know, shortly after the draft, he was babied a little bit and yeah. understandably so and i yeah. think that's part of the reason why so we're gonna need to see him stretched out but i don't know if i really saw him throw this well at more than one single singular game last year there was he had a couple one-off performances in peoria it was never but, in springfield no and and this never. is he's doing this against some better competition and it's funny like we talked to griff actually after the game and you know it's like oh here's an easy opportunity we, we didn't get to see that game because yeah. we were in st lucie instead uh, and so we, we get to the game or we, we were driving back and I was like, oh, let's congratulate Griff. But then I had to ask him, I'm like, all right, how did, how did Tank Hens look? And he said he was disgusted. So here's, here's the deal. Punched out against Tank Hens, Griffin did. Punched out against Tank Hens, homered off of Max Radjic. On and like then, a fastball, like running in on the hands to dead center. Yeah. And then 106 on a single off the top of the mound against TK Roby. Yes. So and, like, and it was Hens who he said, I mean, everybody was saying it looks gross over the top. The problem was, I think. Last year, it, just, it, it was kind of popping out of the hand a little bit. He just he didn't seem to have that consistent feel. And now you have the fastball riding, the slider. He said looked like the heater until the very last moment, and then the changeup. It's back. So you have three pitches now doing opposite things, and I think it's a tunneling nightmare for hitters. Because again, that that was the one thing that Griffin said is like that was a slider that looked as much like a fastball as he's seen in a while, and just dives. So. I think that was what made him so good from over the top and having that three different directions, basically. And I think he lost that a little bit last year with the finger issue as well. Yeah. I think it's back. And that's a way that he can be really effective and have strong platoons, you know, not have any platoon yeah. splits because he's got the change up for hitters yeah. from one side. He, I think that slider is good enough. He's always going to beat lefties. Yeah. Always. And that slider, again, that was against the lefty in grip. Yeah. It just dives downward. So he's got ways to beat lefties you know, two different ways now. And I think with righties, he's got a way to beat righties. And now. you know, I like the right on right change. I think his change from that release point good can work right on right. Um, it's just good to see him healthy and feeling himself again. And I thought he was really impressive when I went back and watched the video. It's what we got. That's spring breakout. Yeah. One of the last things I just wanted to mention is it was fun to see Charlie Soto throw. That was like the pro debut. Yeah. Um, he definitely had some young nerves, his whole family being yeah. there. I'm really excited to see more of him because his stuff was fun. And uh, I think the twins have something really good there. But you know, it'll take a little bit of time. And then Thomas White, funky, looked yeah. good. Uh, I, I think he might be a little bit ahead of Noble Meyer in terms of his progression right now. Meyer's a better prospect. But for the Marlins, I think Thomas White might hit the ground running a little bit more. But yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm really excited to continue talking prospects this week. we got a lot of fun content. We're going to be putting out an interview with Dalton Rushing. Another batch, we got yep. Brock Wilkin. And who's the third? we got Chase Dolander. Harry Ford. Harry Ford. Harry Ford also coming out. Then Dolan will be in the next episode yes. that we have coming out behind that. And I think that'll do it for all the interviews. But Top 100, just a couple of days away here. We'll have it out this week too. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you to everybody who subscribed on YouTube. Thank you to those who have also subscribed to the bonus episodes every weekend. Doing a mailbag. Really excited to answer the subscriber questions. Look forward to talking prospects with you later this week.